Hi, uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. My name is Jonathan Rosenthal. I'm the head organizer of the group that should not be named, Harry Potter's New York City Meetup. Um, before we begin, thank you. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to thank Santina Matway and Sintuma Social Club for letting us use the venue today. Uh, please thank her by partaking in the beverages at the bar, um, which is which will be open during the entire course of the presentation. Uh, I would like I would now like to introduce today's speaker, Travis Prinzi. Uh, Travis is the author of several books on Harry Potter, including its latest, Hog's Head Conversations, Essays on Harry Potter, Volume 1. He is also the webmaster of the hogshead.org and appears on Leaky Cauldron's Pottercast as one of the Potter pundits. Mr. Prinzi has spoken at numerous seminars and HP conferences, including Prophecy and Ascatras. And he joins us in New York today. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Travis Prinzi. And sorry, one more note, I just got added, I apologize. Uh, uh, Travis's books are on sale during the entire course of the presentation as well as after. Uh, HP and the Imagination is $20, and Hog's Head uh, Conversations is $15. You can buy both for $30, and Travis will be signing them after the presentation. And once again, ladies and gentlemen, Travis Prinzi. You just covered so much ground in so little time that I needed to cover. That was fantastic. Um, I would just add that you should buy them. <laughs> Um, okay, lots of fun things to talk about tonight. He's already given me, i got to just skip two or three bullet points now, because he's just totally blown my introduction. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> my poor daughter, hi Sophia, by the way, is watching right now. My little daughter and my wife are both watching me on this live stream thing. Sophia, pa it's past your bedtime, Sophia. I'm glad you're up watching Daddy. Of course, Sophia's been sick. She's just been diagnosed with asthma. Oh, poor kid. Which means I'm very tired because I've been up with her a couple nights in a row. Uh, so I'm going to be basically making out with my notes tonight. I'm sorry about that, but I won't be able to make any sense if I don't. And I'm also in a rush tonight, which is why I'm talking very fast. Um, uh, I got a flight at 10.30. So I'm going to do this as I can, hopefully take some questions, maybe some questions from the chat. Hi, everybody out there in the world of the internet. Amazon.com. I know you can't be here to buy these books. Uh, Amazon.com. It's great. Great website. Uh, Harry Potter, Dracula, and Frankenstein is the title of the talk. I'll be talking very little about both Dracula and Frankenstein. I gave it that title to give you sort of the tip off that we are talking about Gothic literature tonight. We're talking about the frightening elements of Harry Potter. And there's some scary stuff in there. As Stephen King said, the Death Eaters scared him. Death Eaters never really scared me, and it makes me kind of happy that. I wasn't scared by something that Stephen King was scared by, but uh, there's some scary stuff in there. Even Stephen King, who's a really freaky guy, got freaked out by some things in Harry Potter. But I want to back up a little bit and talk first a, a, a little bit about why in the world we should bother talking about Gothic lit and Harry Potter. And, and first of all, I want to back up even farther and say, why well, are you talking about Harry Potter? And everyone here knows why, because it's awesome. <laughs> Simple enough. But there's more to it than it's awesome. And I want to talk about Tolkien for a minute, J.R.R. Tolkien. Yes, yes, because Tolkien, <laughs> Tolkien tells us why we love these stories. And the reason we love these stories is because fantasy fiction in particular satisfies what he called ancient human desires. And fantasy fiction does that in particular because, you know, when we're young, like G.K. Chesterton says, a little three-year-old, and, and my daughter can attest to this, a little three-year-old gets really excited simply at a door being opened. Daddy, did you open the door? Like, and she's so happy about it. And now when you get older, you're 12 years old, at 13, you're opening a door is not a big deal anymore. The, the world, that's kind of gotten boring, and now you need to open the door and see a dragon, like G.K. Chesterton said. And so fantasy fiction is that thing that brings us back to that kind of childlike wonder. That, as Chesterton said, the world is wild. It's a wild and startling place. And so Tolkien said that fantasy fiction, above all other types of art, satisfy ancient human desires and longings. And he talked about this cauldron of story, this sort of ever-simmering pot of soup. And each author comes along and adds new ingredients to the soup and makes their own soup from ingredients that already existed. So there are all these great stories all throughout time. It's always been there. And, and along comes a Tolkien himself, and he throws in Gandalf and the Hobbits, and, and the soup takes on a certain flavor. And along comes Rowling, and she throws in Harry Potter and Voldemort, and the soup takes on a different flavor that we all taste and we like. And we can spend all the time in the world that we want dissecting all the ingredients of it. But I want to talk tonight about just tasting the soup. That's the key. 
why do we love these books so much? And one of those reasons is the Gothic elements. Uh, and, we, and, and we love them so much particularly because, as I said, they, they satisfy ancient human desires. Those long lines at bookstores on the nights that the books were released, these were not just uh, excited fans looking for a great story. We were all starving people, and the bookstores were the soup kitchens. And so here we go now to talk about one particular aspect of, of human desire that the Harry Potter series satisfies, and that's to overcome our fears. And so it's Halloween time, it's time to talk about this sort of thing, and uh, Rowling does this very, very well. What is Gothic literature? Uh, there are a lot of ways we can answer this and a lot of things we can say. Uh, I'm going to talk about a few that I'll be coming back to throughout the entirety of this talk. Uh, uh, Gothic's uh, literature usually has a setting in which there are claustrophobic spaces, like that bathroom. <laughs> you been in there? It's scary. That is a Gothic bathroom. <laughs> so there are claustrophobic spaces, sort of fear-producing spaces that characters find themselves in. Those are my books for me. Uh, there are usually some stereotypical gothic stuff like castles and ghosts, werewolves, vampires, monsters, goblins, those sorts of things. Supernatural fear-producing beings and, and old archaic settings, that sort of thing. Uh, but deeper than that, and more fundamental to gothic literature, are a couple of really important things. One is that they're mysterious. There's some sort of mystery going on that we can't figure out because it's outside of the realm of our normal experience. This is pretty much every day for the Dursleys looking with Harry Potter. I mean, they just sort of live in gothic fear. Along come the letters from no one. Along comes this boy who can grow his hair back in a day and they're just scared to death. Uh, so there's the mystery. This is why the mysterious element is why gothic literature tends to dovetail really nicely with detective fiction. So Edgar Allan Poe, who's so well known for his gothic literature and his dark stuff, also wrote some of the earliest detective fiction. So there's the story, I forget the name of it at the moment, but the whole story revolves around a mystery of a murder that happened inside a room that was locked from the inside. That sounds familiar to Harry Potter fans, right? Beginning of Half-Blood Prince. I mean, now that the wizarding answer to that is, well, the Death Eater apparated into the room, killed the person, and apparated out. <laughs> the simple answer. It's not as simple in, in our own world since we can't apparate, which is, I'd be able to get on a plane a lot faster if we could do that. <laughs> so there's something mysterious going on, and this is, uh, this is Sherlock Holmes, uh, the Hound of the Baskervilles. The Baskerville comes and seeks him out because, he, see, he actually says, I think it's Henry Baskerville, I, mean, I don't know if I'm getting the name right, comes to Holmes and says, uh, I, I don't think you're the best detective, and Holmes is like, I don't think you're the best detective, but you're the only one who's willing to accept a possible supernatural explanation for what's going on. And so you get that kind of gothic feel to, to Sherlock Holmes, and there's, there's detective and gothic kind of coming together. Um, so the key to this is that it's unknown. H.P. Lovecraft said, the oldest and strongest fear, H.P. Lovecraft is the father of modern gothic fiction, Stephen King loved him, uh, he said the oldest and strongest fear of mankind, or the oldest and strongest emotion of mankind is fear, and the strongest kind of fear is fear of the unknown. So that which is not explained, we fear. And so we'll be returning to that throughout. Are you excited about where the wild things are? Yes. 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 Coming out this week, I need to reach over here and grab this book because I have a quote I want to read to you. Because the other thing that happens with a gothic lit is, well, it's scary. And so our kids shouldn't read it, right? We shouldn't have, we've should, we got to sanitize the fairy tales. And you know, you know, the original Cinderella story, the sisters were cutting their toes off to get their feet to fit in this look, right? You know, well, we can't have that. Did you like the tales of Beetle the Bard? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Come on, this was fantastic. That commentary about the one woman who was sanitizing fairy tales and then it was causing children to throw up. I mean, it's really great. Um, so Maurice Sendak, just like J.K. Rowling, was confronted for his scary images and where the wild things are. I, I, I started reading this book to my daughter recently and it's, it's so, she loves it. Um, so he got confronted about these scary images and he answered like this, most frightening to children is to dream their own figures of fear and find no analog in anything they hear about or read. <laughs> 